Welcome to the Hank Cisco Show, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, don't touch that remote. Our show today is going to be talking about the heart. You know, there's so many songs, heart of my heart, so many songs about the heart. So now we're going to really look into the heart and uh, see what, uh, what a heart, how a heart operates, how we, how we uh, uh, get treated with the heart problems. So there's so many different doctors. One takes care of this, one takes care of that. But the doctor we're, I'm going to interview today is, has experience on something that, that I have here. I have a pacemaker. And uh, so he's going to explain about pacemakers. And this is your show. This is, you know, doctors don't make house calls anymore. We're coming into your house. And I want you to meet in this corner, Thomas, Dr. Klein. Welcome to Hank Cisco Show. Thanks so much. Okay, doctor. I, I'm building you up now. Okay. Now tell me something about yourself. So I moved to the area recently. I work at Einstein Montgomery Medical Center. Where are you from? I'm from New York City originally. New York? Mm -hmm. I was born in Brooklyn, so we got something in common. All right. I'm from Manhattan, actually. Manhattan. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I will have Manhattan. Go ahead. <laughs> So it's been a few years since I've been there, but I... Um, you were at Einstein Hospital on Germantown Pike here. Now I'm at Einstein Hospital at Germantown Pike. Montgomery. And I work with uh, cardiology consultants, and I specialize in heart rhythm problems. All right, the rhythm, right? Right. Okay. And you, with Dr. Velasco, you had some other doctors with you, too? Yeah, there, there are almost 20 cardiologists wow. in our group overall. And we collaborate with a lot of the other doctors and surgeons over at the hospital there. Right. Okay, so tell me something about your job. You go to work in the morning, right? Right. I go to work in the morning, and I see patients who have heart rhythm problems. And there are a lot of different heart rhythm problems that people can have, and they can be treated in a lot of different ways. Heart, the heart can beat too slowly. It can be too fast, yeah. and depending on what's going on with like the disorder, and uh, they could, when when it should be treated, you treat them, right? Yeah, well, yeah. So generally, what we do is we treat people who have symptoms, and by symptoms, I mean people f can feel lightheaded if their heart rate is going too slow or it's going too fast. Right. People can sometimes pass out or faint, and a lot of the time when people faint, that can be caused by heart rhythm problems because uh -huh. the heart isn't beating effectively. It's, if it's beating too slow or too fast, and the blood flow to the, the, blood flow to the brain isn't normal. Oh, yeah, well, I, I, I guess that's what happened with me. Uh, I had a, a hip operation, um, Dr. Palaio operated, and afterwards, uh, after the operation, uh, Dr. Blasco, who was in your it's one of your mm -hmm. team, right? Yep. And he came and told me, he says, look, he says, during the operation, your heart was going, like, boop, 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 wasn't going, you know, as fast as it should be going. Mm -hmm. And we recommend you get a pacemaker. So I got a pacemaker over here. And uh, so that keeps me going, right? Right. That's now, right. All right. Now, what is, you, you didn't mention something about the symptoms. A little bit more. Let me tell you. And then uh, when should I go see a doctor about yeah, so, I mean, generally, if the symptoms can be very variable, but different symptoms can be people can be passing out, like I said, they can faint, they can feel lightheaded, especially when they exert and themselves. about when you walk a long distance, you get tired. That's another one, exactly. That was exactly. one with me. I used to get to the top of the steps. I said, oh, my God, I said, like it was, I was walking over the China Wall or something, and I was really tired. Right. I knew something was wrong, and, you know, that was after... Uh, the second, then the operation of Dr. Anderson mm -hmm. found the, uh, what, 75% blockage? Mm -hmm. so. so shortness of breath, especially with exertion, is, right. is common in, in heart problems that I treat as well. Right. Okay. Now, you got some, uh, some tools. We'll call them tools? Right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll call them tools. Uh, now, what's the fib? So AFib is the most common abnormal heart rhythm. It's called atrial fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation is an abnormal heart rhythm that comes from the top chamber of the heart. It's not a life-threatening problem, but it can cause three different issues. 
number one, people can, it can increase the risk of stroke for people. So we often prescribe blood thinners for certain patients, uh -huh. okay? It can also cause the heart the to... Blood thinner is what, to make the blood flow with uh, possible blockage or something? Or? No, so uh, why don't I give a little uh, example yeah, on, okay. my, uh, on my iPad here. I lift it up. And I will uh, show you exactly what's going on. So here you can see that in a normal heart, the heart rhythm starts in the top chamber of the heart here, and the electricity sort of flows down to the bottom chamber, and that causes the heart to hear. pump normally. Okay? In atrial fibrillation, which is right here on my left side, there's a lot of random electrical signals going on in the top chamber of the heart, and when that's happening, the top chamber of the heart doesn't pump effectively. Blood sits in the top chamber of the heart and it can clot. And when a blood clot forms in the heart, it can go up to the brain and cause a stroke. That's, that's there. So what we do is we prescribe blood thinners which make the blood less prone to clotting in the top chamber of the heart and it can protect people from having strokes. I see that thing is beating. Is that the way the heart beats? That is the way the heart beats. Again, it starts in the top chamber of the heart is the electrical signal first comes on and that gives the heart the signal it needs to beat and contract so that your blood flows normally around your body. Yeah. Now you got some, is this what you put in there? No, so this is, this <laughs> is something else. I got all these toys I want oh, to play. Oh, I know. There oh, are, I'm out of toys. They're tools, I'm sorry. <laughs> there are a lot of tools. So for atrial fibrillation, we often prescribe medicine to sort of regulate the heartbeat and put people back into normal rhythm because sometimes people can feel pretty badly with atrial how, fibrillation. How, within the last, uh, how many years has this been on, like uh, you've been doing this, like years ago, we say 15, 20 years ago, this wasn't around or what? This has been around for as long as any of us can remember. Oh, yeah? And, yeah, and it, the atrial fibrillation can affect up to, you know, there's probably a 15, 20% chance that each person will get atrial fibrillation in their lifetime. So it's, it's a very high percentage. And what we can do about it is we can give medicine. We often sometimes do ablation procedures for atrial fibrillation, and we can do that also for other abnormal heart rhythms. And I'll talk a little bit about that with you. Go ahead. So atrial, for, so sorry, so ablation is, a procedure where we can actually move small wires around the heart by introducing them into the veins in the leg. And we bring these wires up to the heart, we can find where these abnormal rhythms are coming from, yeah. and we heat up the end of the wire so that it gets rid of the rhythm. And this is an example of one of these wires that we use. So this wire is placed in one of the veins in the leg. It's brought up That's to the heart. So Right, right, the right. In the, towards the groin, and we move it up to the heart. We figure out where. How does it find its way up there? So we can actually steer it like this. And oh! Yeah. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. In other words, well, wait a minute. How does it go? With so you push this little. So, and that actually. Oh, it's like remote. Yeah. It's like a remote control. So we also use other systems like x-rays to know exactly where these where wires going. are going. Right, right. And we use more complicated right. systems that are almost like GPS systems to know where the wires are going. Right. We bring them to different parts of the heart and we actually heat up the tip of this wire so it can go to where the abnormal rhythm is coming from and it can get rid of that rhythm. And that's called an ablation. Which it levels it off even it makes it go away, so then the rhythm's back to normal. So these procedures, have, we've been doing them for, you know, probably close to 20 years now, and it can really be um, very beneficial to patients in terms of improving symptoms, I, and they don't even have to be admitted to the I, hospital a I lot see of the time. This, I see this as, this is the pacemaker. It's what I have over here. Right, exactly. And it's only like, how, how far in does it go? About half inch inch it's under the skin or yeah so these so these devices are other things that we use to sort of regulate the heart rhythm and pacemaker a pacemaker is something that we would implant under the skin and it goes underneath the skin so you can feel it i'm sure you can yeah, feel I your can, pacemaker yeah. 
and it goes underneath the skin but over the muscle so it's not buried in there too deep. The procedure of putting one of these in only takes maybe 45 minutes or an hour and it's connected to a couple wires similar in size to this wire that are connected yeah. to this, right. go into one of the veins here and feed down the heart. And these wires sit in the heart and they regulate the heart rhythm to make sure it's not slowing down right, right. or in some cases speeding right, up right. too much. And this is a little bit bigger though. This is, this does more work. This is, it serves a different purpose. So this is called a defibrillator. And this is a special kind of defibrillator called a biventricular defibrillator. So yeah, you'll notice this is bigger than a pacemaker is. And this makes sure that the heart doesn't beat too slow, just like the pacemaker does, but it also does something else. Some people, especially people who have blockages in their heart arteries or coronary artery disease right. or weakened heart pumping functions like congestive heart failure, are at risk for developing life-threatening, dangerous heart rhythms. So this serves as an insurance policy so if someone develops a life-threatening heart rhythm, which typically are very, very fast, this device will serve almost as a paramedic does when they say all clear and they shock your heart back into rhythm. Yeah, but boom, boom. Right. Yeah. So this device does that, but it does it all from within inside your body. And it's connected to a couple wires, again, that go into the vein up well, they, here. They're, they're connected. If it's in there, you're connected. Yeah, so what we do is that we actually make a small incision in the upper part of the chest. We feed a couple of wires down to the heart, yeah. and these wires sit in the heart. Then we connect those wires to this, put it under the skin, and sew it closed. So when people have devices like this, nothing is actually sitting outside their body. Oh. Everything's within the body. Right here. And right. everything's right there. Everything's sewed up. And you could never see that anyone had one of these but devices. Now, since you left college, college where, uh, what they call medical school. Right. Right. What medical school did you go to? I went to Stony Brook in New York State in Long What's Island. The name of it? Uh, it's from the state school in New York. Oh. Stony Brook University. And what part of New York? You live in New York City? I'm from New York City, but when I went to medical school, I lived in Long Island. Uh, Long Island. Mm -hmm. Well, I lived in 92nd in Columbus. When okay. I was, I was a professional boxer, and I lived over there. And at my gymnasium, uh, where I trained, was down on uh, 14th Street, 8th, 8th Avenue and 14th Street. And uh, I used to walk from 92nd Street down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So I did part of my uh, medical training at Mount Sinai Hospital, which I'm that's sure a, you're that's familiar a big, with. That's a big big one in New York. That's right across town from where you were on 92nd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was, that, was, uh, that was well known uh, when I lived in New York because it was whatever. But uh, now you're a, a heart doctor, right? Right. We, we have different types of heart doctors, right? Mm -hmm. Now Dr. Blasco's in your, in your office. Mm -hmm. Now what, what, what he, he's the one that diagnoses, right? Right. Tell me something like that. So, Doctor, oh, you got a team. Tell me something about your team, Eric. Right. You know, one throws a pass, one catches. You know, it's like a football team. Right. Center, right. That's yeah. That's an excellent point. So we we collaborate to treat all kinds of heart diseases because there's a big spectrum, and some some doctors are we call them general cardiologists. So what they do is they sort of see the patient first and they can help diagnose what the problem is. Take the tests and stuff. Do any testing that needs what to be done. What kind of tests, like blood tests? What's so we do blood tests and tests that are, you know, from the blood. We also do imaging tests like echocardiograms. Oh yeah, echo. Which are ultrasounds of the heart. So and some people are more familiar with those when they're having babies. They do echo card and they do uh, echograms like ultrasounds yeah. of you know, babies when they're still in their mom's belly, but we also do those tests for the heart. So we can see how the heart structure what's, and function is. And what's the other one where you have to take exercise, see the heart? Right. So what do they call that? The, that's a stress test. Stress test, yeah. Well, now that stress test almost killed me. <laughs> right, right. The second uh, brother, uh, test I had, they had an injection. Tell me about that. So that's a difference. That's another type of stress test. Stress test. Because mm -hmm. people are afraid to go. Yeah, tell me that, that, that. Some of the things that people should be aware of that are afraid to go get checked. Check it out. When in doubt, check it out, right? I agree with you, yeah. 
A lot of the time when people are having symptoms, we can treat these symptoms and prevent the symptoms from getting worse or from something very bad happening like people passing out and hurting themselves or from people even dying of these heart problems. Right. The heart is, you know, I would argue, right. the most important organ in your body. Right. That's but, but some may argue the brain is pretty important too. But well, you know. I guess I, if you need <laughs> both, <laughs> you need both. I guess well, that, that, that one is the motor and the other one is the gas tank. I don't know what. Right, but if if the heart's not working right, people can actually die. So getting it checked out and making sure that everything is sort of working the right way, especially if you're having symptoms, and those symptoms could be shortness of breath, chest pain, passing out palpitations, which is a very common symptom yeah, for people yeah. that I see when they, they feel like their heart is racing a lot. Um, and you know, we have a lot of testing and a lot of the treatments we have can be very life-saving. And not all of those mean you're now you know, confined to living an altered lifestyle. Most of the treatments we have can be you know, used in combination with the same lifestyle that people have had throughout their whole lives. Well, so. How about diet? Does diet have anything to do with this or what? I mean, we're talking about people to prevention and then also uh, be aware of uh, things that could be helpful. Right. So diet, exercise, and weight loss are probably the most important first steps to making sure that you're, you have a healthy heart and that you're going to live a long time. Um, you know, there are minor considerations as far as what which diet is better and a lot yeah, of the time yeah, people yeah. get caught up that they should use the Atkins diet or they should eat less fat or they should eat less sugar and the truth is that you know as long as people eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and they do everything in moderation, moderation that's probably right, the right, most right. important thing in my mind and then you know uh, uh, I see some people oh you got to exercise and I see some of these people running huh, huh. I look they're half dead I mean when I was trained in New York Stillman's gym was well-known uh, box right on uh, on 8th Avenue. It had a big sign there. You are here to train, not strain. You know, I mean, these guys uh, uh, knocked themselves out. I don't think, you know, and same thing, we didn't work out, we didn't feel good. If mm -hmm. I didn't work out good, I didn't train. I just take it easy, make shadow box, just move it around, hit the bag or skip rope it a little bit. I wouldn't do anything strenuous. So people, they think, oh, I'm, I, got, I got to exercise, you know. If you don't feel good, you don't exercise. You're only knocking yourself out. Right. I agree with you. If you're ever having symptoms like you're excessively short of breath or having chest pain or something like that when you're exercising, then that's probably not the right thing, and you should go speak about that with your doctor. Get check. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, you're a young, good-looking guy. Uh, uh, what caused you to say, I want to become a doctor? I mean, what, what, when, when did you drop the seed? In high school, junior high school? No. Uh, your no. parents uh, encourage you? Do you have a, any other doctors in the family? No. So for me, it was a little bit later. I don't have any other doctors in my family. And I was actually, I'm actually a musician, so I was thinking about becoming a musician. But I, uh, at the end of college and after college, I decided that, you know, uh, medicine's interesting. It's always advancing. We're constantly learning, and we, it's, it, we get to learn, and I like interacting with people a lot about their, you know, trying to help them out. So it, for me, it worked. Yeah. yeah. Well, did your family encourage you to do this? Um, they were supportive. They supportive. Yeah, right? they were supportive. <laughs> they proud of you, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, all right, now, you're at Einstein. Mm -hmm. Now, what's that mean, that you only stay in one hospital, or how does that work? I actually go to a couple of hospitals. I spend the vast majority of my time at Einstein. At Einstein Hospital, we have some great facilities over there for performing some of these procedures that I spend a lot of my time doing. And everything is very up to date. We have all the latest equipment that we, right. that we have the uh, privilege and opportunity to use. And it, it really makes it a pleasure. And the staff right. over there is fantastic, too. Well, when I was a police officer, I used to drive the emergency wagon. And I used to go to Montgomery Hospital. I mean, I used to take them into the uh, receiving ward. And uh, I remember uh, I got to know a lot of doctors, you know, bringing mm -hmm. them in there, nurses and all. And they didn't do no hard operations at Montgomery. You know, they would just take you, I don't know, they would check you out a little bit and then send you to another hospital in Philly or someplace. Mm -hmm. But now we have it right here. Yeah. 
Now, the, the, uh, I was just wondering, they don't do anything with brain operation. Uh, all the brains in Philadelphia, like a tumor in the brain or some. Oh, they do. They do some things for the brain as well. There are people, here? yeah, people who are having strokes. They can help them out tremendously. Here. So yeah, we're going to have. We're going to. I'm going to have another doctor here mm -hmm. that uh, specializes in, in strokes. I don't. Know, what's his name? I forget. Uh, Dr. Blasco told me. I told him I want to get somebody to talk about strokes. That would be great. I right. Think, yeah. He, he's going to come on. Mm -hmm. I got somebody. Another doctor is going to talk about kidneys. Right. right. Yeah. It's a <laughs> you know, we have doctors for every organ nowadays. Right. So right, we, right, we, uh, right, right. we keep busy. So what what what's in the future? What are some of the things that you'd like to see happen? Mm -hmm. So we're doing more and more procedures at Einstein Montgomery as far as ablation goes. And we have a lot of experience doing ablation for atrial fibrillation. And we can help people out with that a lot. And to be, to be honest with you, I actually came here today. We were doing one. I was actually doing one with my, one this of my morning. partners this morning. Right. And we, I actually Sounds came Sounds okay? Down. Yeah, it's I going great. i him up. It's going great. Hello, what's his name? Hey, yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> He'll be over there and check you out when he gets done here. Okay, right, okay, good. I started, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're going to continue doing that. We're continuing to build our practice as far as helping take care of people with abnormal heart rhythms. We have this other device here, yeah. which came out a couple of years ago, and this is a very small device. And what this does in people who have symptoms like palpitations or they've passed out or they feel lightheaded, this device can actually be implanted under the skin to record where, the, what part of the body it is right under the skin on the chest basically where near where my tie sits here and this can be implanted under the skin and can what they call that it's called an implantable loop recorder and it records the heart rhythm for up to three years so if people are having heart rhythm problems we'll know about it and it can help us get to the bottom of why they're having the symptoms well, that's, that's that they're sort of having. That's prevention or, or detection or something to let you know there's a problem up front? Right, exactly. So we, you know, we can put these in people's bodies to help record their heart rhythms and help know the best way to treat them. And uh, I, now I have a pacemaker here. How long is that going to work? How, uh, what, what, uh, maybe the, is the battery or something? Is the thing going to run out on me? Uh, yeah, so. Don't, don't, don't talk to me. Don't tell me what's what. So we monitor these pacemakers by you I, coming I in. Are you monitored now? You, not right now, but I'm guessing tonight when you go home, you have a little monitor that sits by your bedside that may talk with your oh, pacemaker. Yeah, yeah, I have something like that. Right. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> And that'll, that'll keep an eye on your pacemaker, make sure all the wires are working appropriately and make sure the battery isn't running down too much. The battery lasts, we usually tell people seven to 10 years, but more modern pacemakers can last even longer than that, out to maybe 13 years. Yeah. When the battery runs out, it's actually pretty easy to replace it. We don't change the battery in one of these pacemakers. We just open up the old incision, leave the wires where they are, and we replace this little uh, pacemaker with another one. And we just hook it up to the wires and That's sew it. it up. And that only takes maybe a half hour. Yeah, it's, it's almost, uh, oh my God. Mm -hmm. And I have this, uh, this pac pacemaker, I had it, uh, that you say, well, about last, what, four or five years or so? No, it lasts probably close to 10, actually. Oh yeah? Yeah. Well, I'm 91. So, I so you're going to you're going to need a few of them, I, I think. <laughs> you when know, you're 121, you can you come to me and I'll change your scary. Uh, pacemaker. Uh, after the operation, uh, Dr. Anderson and uh, Dr. Blasco, what they said, they mentioned, uh, says, you know, he says 15, 20 years ago, they would not have operated on me because I was 91. Right. Because of, uh, you know, the age and all. But now with, tell me, that's what what's so good about uh, the new procedures and things it's doing that that here I'm alive right. because <laughs> of the advancement, right? Yeah, we've made Otherwise, a. Otherwise, I'd be dead. They wouldn't even bother. Say, let me. Say, well, he's 91. Let him go. You know, go there. Go to St. Patrick's Cemetery. You know. Yeah, we've made some huge steps in being able to treat people for very complex diseases at at relatively low risk to them, and. Obviously, you're a sort of exception to the rule, being that you're 91 and you look as fantastic as you do. But 
you know, 91 is 91. Yeah. So, and we're able to treat you effectively at, at really yeah. acceptable risk well, that's, to that's you. That's what uh, Dr. Andrews said after. He says, you know, he says, after the operation, he says, you, you come out of it like a 40, 50 year old man. He says, young, you know, and uh, so that, that was good to hear, but I don't know, but maybe because I was kept myself in shape, boxing, condition, and was a policeman, I used to be active, you know, and uh, motorcycle, and also, I guess, uh, that had a lot to do with it, but I didn't overexercise, you know. I think staying active when you're younger, as far as your 30s, 40s, and 50s, is very, very important to make sure yeah. that you live just, a long just time. Just don't throw the towel in, right? Right. Don't throw the towel in because of age. Right. Right. right? And uh, now, what else? Is there anything else that you do to keep people alive? Mm -hmm. So. Sometimes people who are very sick can have cardiac arrest, and that's when people actually die suddenly. And that's the most sort of extreme electrical problem wow. that we can see with the heart. Right. And a lot of the time, people have heart attacks, and people think that they die of heart attacks. They don't generally die of heart attacks. Right, they please. die of right. rhythm problems. So we can implant defibrillators to prevent them from dying of these heart rhythms. Okay. Well. I think we covered everything about the, about the heart. Dr. Klein, Einstein Montgomery. Thanks a lot, you know, and uh, all these here uh, in, uh, tools. <laughs> I call them toys. <laughs> They're toys. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, thanks a lot for allowing us to come into your home. And uh, we're here on an educational thing to, you know, whenever you don't feel good, check it out. When in doubt, check it out. And uh, may God bless each and every one. Okay, Dr. Klein, thank you. Thanks so much. Bye.